Hello, everyone. Welcome to Berkeley Law Clinical Program CLE in partnership with Alumni Engagement. The clinical program is made up of 14 clinics and have a joint mission of advancing racial, economic, and social justice. We provide students with a foundation in law and practice while hands-on client work helps them build critical lawyering skills. We are so happy that so many of you are able to join us today. The clinical program is excited to start offering CLEs in January and would love to see in the chat or the Q&A later on any other topics you're interested in for future offerings. Today, I am happy to introduce the faculty co-director of the clinical program, Roxana Altos. Roxana is also co-director of the International Human Rights Law Clinic. She is a human rights law lawyer and scholar and very importantly, a Berkeley Law alum herself. Today, she will speak to us about inter-American litigation against the United States, giving an overview of litigation before the Inter-American Commission and discuss litigation strategies as well. Um, before I hand it off to Roxana, I just want to note that instructions for how you will receive CLE credit will be dropped in the chat throughout the session. And during today's session, if you have any questions, please feel free to include those in the q and I'll track those. And then at about 1245, Roxana will open the discussion up for questions. Thank you again all for joining. Uh, Roxana, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone who has joined us for today's event. I was told that over 160 people signed up, which is just a huge group. And I'm really thrilled that so many of you are interested in learning about the litigation before the Inter-American system. Some of you may not be familiar with the Inter-American Commission, and others have participated in hearings or have cases pending, I assume. So I've tried to design a presentation that has something for everyone. Um, if I don't cover an issue that you're interested in hearing about, please bring it up during Q&A. Um, sorry, give me one second. So I can fix this. Technology and children and animals. You have to be careful with. One more second and hopefully this will work. All right. Um, Laura, let me know if, if, if that looks right. Um, so the Inter-American Commission has the authority to determine state responsibility for human rights violations committed against individuals. Um, in Latin America, the impacts of the Inter-American systems interventions have been trans tangible and transformative. The commission has exposed state responsibility for grave human rights violations provided a venue to victims and survivors, and strengthened the domestic incorporation of human rights standards. Reports and decisions by the Commission and the Inter-American Court have led to the release of persons in arbitrary detention, the revocation of amnesty laws, the return of ancestral lands, and the criminal investigation and prosecution of high-ranking officials, and, and much more. The inter-American inter system has also really influenced law in Latin America. One academic told me that it was quite common for constitutional and Supreme Courts of Latin America to cite to decisions by the US Supreme Court. Those citations are becoming more infrequent as courts are more likely today to cite to look to the inter-American court for persuasive authority. This is not to say that the Inter-American Commission and court do not have significant flaws and shortcomings. We'll touch on some of those today, but I wanted to start today's conversation by recognizing some of the achievements and impacts of the system, because I think in the United States, because of our legal system, because of our legal culture, because of our politics, our history, it's very easy to dismiss 
the significance of this system of protection. So my presentation is gonna be divided into three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and, and give a primer about how it operates. During the second part, I'm gonna talk about litigation generally. And during the last part, I'm gonna talk about a case that I'm currently litigating before the Inter-American Commission. So um, what is the Inter-American Commission? The commission exists within the Organization of American States, which was established in December of 1948 with the adoption of the OAS Charter and the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. The United States actively participated in and shaped the discussion about human rights, not just at this regional level, but also in the United Nations shaping these discussions about shape these discussions about human rights while at the same time the united states was seeking to maintain legal apartheid at home in 1959 the oas charter was amended to establish the inter-american commission on human rights the commission is one of oh, i think i jumped ahead is one of two bodies established by the oas to promote and protect rights in the Americas. The other body, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has binding authority to adjudicate human rights cases, but the United States has not ratified the court's jurisdiction, so the court does not have the authority to decide cases against the United States. Therefore, today's presentation is going to focus on the commission. The commission has a mandate to promote and defend human rights and has interpreted this mandate quite broadly. It's, the, the commission is also headquartered in DC. The commission is comprised of seven human rights independent experts. They do not represent any state, but they are elected by the member states of the OAS. Currently, commissioners include nationals from Mexico, the Caribbean, South and Central America. These are part-time unpaid positions. There's currently no US national on the commission, which is unusual. From 1960 to 2001, there was always a US national among the commissioners. After 9-11, there was a period of a few years when the, can when the OAS General Assembly did not select the candidate proposed by the US. One could say it was a form of protest against the Iraq war. During the elections last year, the United States did not propose a candidate. The secretariat of the commission is really what moves the commission's work. The current secretariat is Tanya Renon. She's an academic and former executive director of Amnesty International in Mexico. She's also the, she's the head of the administrative state of the Inter-American Commission, which is comprised about, of about three dozen lawyers and other professionals. The commission has interpreted its mandate to promote and to defend human rights, um, to include the authority to conduct on-site visits, issue reports, convene hearings, and adjudicate cases. The commission conducts on-site visits regularly to examine the human rights situation in different countries. During those visits, the commission meets with government officials and advocacy groups, and most importantly, hears directly from victims and survivors. Based on those visits, the commission issues country reports that examine compliance with human rights treaties and the human rights situations in countries. It also issues thematic reports. And in 2018, the commission released reports on children and adult criminal legal systems in the United States and police violence against African-Americans in the United States. The commission also meets four times a year and in at least two of those sessions holds hearings. Regularly, those hearings have focused, usually one or two hearings per session on the United States. The commission has also has the authority to examine complaints of human rights violations committed against individuals. So let's talk about the litigation. The commission has two procedures. One, the individual complaint procedure, 
and the second precautionary measures. Precautionary measures are injunctive measures issued by the Inter-American Commission in situations of eminent and grave risk of irre irreparable damage to fundamental rights. In the United States, the commission has granted precautionary measures to stay executions, prevent deportations, address lack of medical attention for detainees during COVID, to protect individuals with developmental disabilities subjected to electric shocks in the custody of an institution in Massachusetts. Also precautionary measures have been issued to protect the rights of victims of the US government's family separation policy and in many other situations. Today, I'm gonna to focus not on precautionary measures, but on the individual complaint mechanism. So who can file a case or a petition before the Inter-American Commission? The Inter-American Commission has very liberal standing requirements. Anyone can file a case, any organization can file a case. It is not even necessary to have the victims consent in order to file a case. However, the petition must allege a violation of a treaty, uh, one of the Inter-American treaties. So the United States has not ratified any of the Inter-American human rights treaties including the main treaty, the American Convention on Human Rights. So you may, may be wondering, how does the Inter-American Commission have the authority to decide cases against the United States? This slide summarizes the commission's position, which it has sustained for more than 40 years. In summary, the commission asserts its authority to adjudicate petitions against the United States because the United States is a party to the OAS Charter, a member state of the OAS. And the United States has agreed to abide by human rights as a member state, as defined by the American Declaration. The United States has also approved the Inter-American Commission statute. 40 years of precedent, however, has not stopped the United States from objecting to the application of the American Declaration and challenging the authority of the Inter-American Commission. So as a party to litigation, the United States has made basically the same argument in cases for over 40 years, although those arguments have failed time and time again. There are two stages to litigation before the Inter-American system, admissibility and merits. During the admissibility stage, the commission determines whether the body can exercise jurisdiction and during the merits phase, the commission must decide whether the facts constitute violations and if violations were committed, what measures of reparation the state should adopt. During the admissibility stage, the major obstacle to overcome is the rule of exhaustion of domestic remedies. The inter-American system, like all international systems, is meant to be subsidiary and complement the domestic system. So cases can only reach or petitions can only be opened by the Inter-American Commission if domestic systems are unable or unwilling to provide redress. But like all good legal rules, there are exceptions to the exhaustion rule. The admissibility procedure or process starts with the initial re review by the secretariat to determine whether the petition complies with minimal requirements. This review unfortunately can take years. The admissibility stage ends with an admissibility or inadmissibility report by the commission. If the case is admitted, the, petition, the petitioners then must demonstrate that facts constitute violations. So the merit stage begins with an offer of friendly settlement by, by the commission. There, I don't believe there's a single case where that offer has been accepted by both the petitioners and the United States. So the United States has not resolved a case before the Inter-American Commission through friendly settlement, but many, many countries have. Friendly settlement is a really interesting and important aspect of the procedure of the Inter-American Commission. If petitioners reject friendly settlement, they then must file a merits brief. Once that merits brief is filed and the state responds, 
the petitioners can then request a hearing. Uh, the merit stage obviously ends with a decision from the Inter-American Commission. Now, the entire process can take anywhere from four to seven years or many more years. Although the commission's determination of responsibility of the state is obviously important, I think though pursuing that final outcome as a singular strategy is insufficient. Litigation before the inter-American system is an opportunity to place an issue of, on the agenda of the international community. It's critical to develop strategies that leverage litigation to amplify the voices of the petitioners, to enter into dialogue with state officials, to influence how narratives are developed, to galvanize public opinion, to prompt policy change, and to create a rallying point that contributes to movement energy. Over the last few years, it has become increasingly clear that U.S. laws and institutions are not up to the task of protecting fundamental human rights. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is the only human rights body in the world that has the authority to adjudicate individual complaints of human rights violations against the United States. So for the next few slides, I wanted to examine the docket of petitions and cases currently pending against the United States. Each year, dozens of cases are filed against the United States, and hundreds of cases are filed against Colombia, Mexico, Peru. Partly the reason why hundreds of cases of petitions are filed against these countries is because victims and survivors and advocates in those countries have decided that the inter-American system is a principal main strategy and that a main tool that they deploy in their advocacy toolkit. Since 2006, 1,500 complaints have been submitted against the United States before the Inter-American Commission. The Commission has decided not to proceed with 75% of those petitions, presumably because they do not comply with basic requirements. The other about 360 petitions are at different stages of the process. Since 2006, the Commission has found 25 cases inadmissible, has admitted 68 cases, and decided the merits of 32 cases involving the United States. By way of comparison, while 1,500 petitions are submitted against the United States, only about 130 complaints have been submitted against Canada during the same time period. And the Commission has only decided three cases uh, of those cases against Canada. <clears throat> the petitions and cases, cases opened by the Commission span a range of issues. However, in the last decade, the vast majority of cases decided by the commission have involved the application of the death penalty in the United States, including issues related to lethal injection, due process, sentencing of juveniles to death, among other issues. In the last two decades, the commission has only issued a handful of decision on cases that don't concern the death penalty. Indeed, I could, have I could only find six cases um, included in this slide um, decided by the commission in the last couple decades that are not about the death penalty. That is about to change, I think. The docket of cases uh, that, are, that have been formally admitted in just the last three years and are currently pending before the Inter-American Commission are extraordinary. These are cases, and I'm just talking about the last three years. These are cases that have cleared the exhaustion hurdle and are waiting hearing, a hearing or a decision by the commission. The commission will have the opportunity through these, this docket to weigh in on some of the most significant and controversial and impactful issues this country faces. Whether these cases help generate the conditions of change, whether victims obtain redress will depend on the commission, government and policymakers, 
but also the advocates, their clients, and the movements that support this, these cases. As I will discuss, it's been far too easy for the U.S. government to play down the significance of inter-American cases. While the U.S. government routinely calls on other nations to respect the inter-American system and comply with decisions from the commission in court, the United States dismisses the authority and jurisdiction of the commission really without consequence. If advocates are going to rely on the inter-American commission to address a docket as important as this, part of the work we need to do is to change that dynamic. Now I want to talk about my litigation experience before the United States, against the United States before the Inter-American Commission. So for the last seven years, I've worked with a group of advocates and clinic students to represent the family of Anastasio Hernandez Rojas in litigation before the Inter-American Commission. During this presentation, I'm going to refer to a range of advocacy efforts um, that we've undertaken. And so I want to explain who I mean by we. Specifically, I wanted to recognize that much of what has been done and much of, of what has been accomplished is really the reflection of the extraordinary and visionary organizing work of Alliance San Diego and Southern Borders Communities Coalition and the incredible support of the more than 20 clinic students that have worked on this case. I really specifically also wanted just to say it has been such an incredible privilege and honor to work with Andrea Guerrero, who's the executive director of Alliance San Diego. We are litigating Anastasio's case at a time when excessive use of force by law enforcement is on the rise in the United States. Every year, over a million people are threatened with or subjected to use of force by U.S. law enforcement. Over 250,000 people are injured as a result, and over 1,000 people are killed. The United States has the highest rate of police shootings among the world's wealthiest countries, and 2022 was one of the deadliest years. According to a national study, fewer than 3% of killings by police result in officers being charged with the crime and no federal border agent has ever been convicted of taking a life while on duty. On May 28, 2010, Customs and Border Protection agents detained Anastasio Hernandez Rojas. He was a longtime resident of San Diego, a father of five and a Mexican national. He was taken to a detention center where an agent kicked Anastasio and re-injured a previously broken ankle. CBP agents detained on this, denied Anastasio medical attention and the right to file a complaint against the agent who assaulted him. Border agents said Anastasio did not behave like a typical alien, but talked loudly, looked directly at the agents, and formally complained about his treatment. By insisting that he be treated with dignity, Anastasio had created a problem for the agents, and so they decided to deport him immediately. He was taken to a secure area for removal to Mexico, where from approximately 9 p.m. to 9.25 p.m., at least eight CBP and ICE agents punched, kicked, dragged, tasered, hogtied, and kneeled on Anastasio's neck and body, while at least nine additional agents, so 17 in total, and dozens of onlookers watched, some recording the incident. The beating took place at the San Isidro crossing next to 10 lanes of traffic and under a pedestrian bridge folks used to go to and return from Tijuana. We know from different sources that including eyewitness video that after the agent deployed a taser four times, last time in stun drive mode directly to Anastasio's chest for 12 seconds, Anastasio lost consciousness. Yet agents continued to kneel on his back and neck, although he was unconscious, unarmed and restrained. Autopsy reports confirmed that Anastasio suffered extensive and serious injuries 
including five broken ribs, hemorrhaging of internal organs. He died of a, from suffering a heart attack, cardiac arrest, and brain damage, and his death was ruled a homicide. The effort to cover up law enforcement brutality began while border agents were still beating on Astacio. When at least 10, 10 agents dispersed civilian eyewitnesses, erased images and video recordings from their camera and cell phones. It continued as Anastasio laid in the hospital brain dead when law enforcement began to fabricate a narrative that blamed Anastasio for his own death. The day after the incident, Border Patrol was already claiming that Anastasio was not restrained, restrained, that he was standing, and that he was combative when he was tased. An eyewitness video of the tasering released two, after, two years after his death directly contradicts the portrayal of Anastasio as the aggressor. The very agencies responsible for Anastasio's death impeded and maneuvered the police investigation away from the truth so that their version of the incident would go unchallenged. CBP agents assumed control of the crime scene and failed to preserve evidence. None of the border agents notified the police, so detectives and investigators who had jurisdiction over the investigation did not arrive until the day after. Border Patrol also deployed a critical incident team. Critical incident teams are clandestine cover-up teams operated by the U.S. Border Patrol for at least the last 30 years. And this team that was deployed left their fing fingerprints all over the investigation. The San Diego incident team intervened before the police even arrived. Critical incident team members participated in incident briefings, seized evidence, controlled the witness list of border agents for police investigators, were present at police interviews of agents, and even questioned witnesses. The critical incident team intervened in, the, in this investigation in all these different ways, although they lacked independence, they lacked imp impartiality, and they did not have legal authorization from Congress to investigate use of force incidents. After we revealed their existence and the illegality of their operations to Congress in 2021, the CBP commissioner at the time decided to disband the teams. In 2015, so five years after Anastasio's death, the Department of Justice, which I think was not a surprise given the way the investigation had been conducted, decided to close the criminal investigation without pursuing charges. In a one-page press release, DOJ describes Anastasio as combative and assaultive, and the Civil Rights Division of DOJ stated that prosecutors could not disprove claims by CBP officers that they had, I quote, used reasonable force in an attempt to subdue and restrain a combative detainee. The agents who beat and tased Anastasio were part of the largest law enforcement agency in the country. Today, Customs and Border Protection, CBP, has more than 60,000 agents, and about 20 of them are stationed on the U.S.-Mexico border. There are more CBP agents in San Diego than there are police officers. Border Patrol claims jurisdiction to act within 100 miles from the border or any coast, which means where 80% of this country's population lives. They also claim the authority within this jurisdiction to enter into private land without a warrant, to engage in racial profiling, and to ask anyone for documents. CBP has one of the weakest accountability structures in the federal government and its agents operate with almost absolute impunity. CBP's system of handling complaints of abuse and misconduct is patently ineffective. To date, no known civil plaintiff in a border killing case has won a trial. And the US Department of Justice has closed all but one investigation of a border killing without pursuing charges. So why did we submit this case before the Inter-American Commission? 
First, we wanted to challenge these structures and these systems that had col have cultivated violence and impunity at the border. By 2015, it was clear to Anastasia's widow, Maria Puga, that Anastasio's death was not the result of a few bad apples, but it was the system working as designed. Second, the community had embraced Anastasio's family and the cause of justice. There was a long list of allies that had walked shoulder to shoulder with Anastasio's family, including our, my co-counsel in the case, Alliance San Diego, but also reporters and journalists community members and artists, and the US, US congressional representatives and the Mexican government had all supported the struggle for justice. The activists involved Cristian Ramirez, Pedro Rios, Andrea Guerrero, were at the hospital when Anastasio was taking his last breaths and also supported the Inter-American litigation throughout the process. Third, we believe that Inter-American case law was on our side. The standards developed by the Inter-American Commission and court over decades regarding use of force, criminal investigations, and the rights of family members to reparations provided a way to gauge how far U.S. law enforcement had strayed from international standard. It provided a way to diagnose reasons for gaps in accountability and a way to identify the reforms necessary to address barriers to redress. And lastly, and perhaps more, most importantly, was Anastasio's family. In particular, Anastasio's widow and the mother of his five children, Maria Puga. She was and continues to be determined that Anastasio will not be taken from her and her family with impunity. She's so determined that she took the step to sue the United States internationally, just as Trump was elected, although she was undocumented at the time and the sole support for her five children. She is a true inspiration. In 2016, we submitted a petition before the Inter-American Commission. We argued that Anastasio was the victim of torture and arbitrarily deprived of his life that US law on use of force and procedural rules that govern the criminal investigation failed to comply with inter-American standards and that his family was denied justice, information and reparations. In 2020, the Inter-American Commission admitted the petition. It is, it's important for you all to know that Anastasio's children reached a settlement with the US for a million dollars. The United States did not accept responsibility as part of the settlement Based on this monetary settlement, the US argued that the government had provided the family, I quote, adequate and effective remedies for actions surrounding his death in the form of significant monetary compensation. The commission unequivocally rejected these arguments in the admissibility rule. Inter-American case law is clear. States cannot kill and pay in order to avoid international responsibility. Anastasio's life has no price. It is settled in American law that in cases of grave violations of human rights, including killings, forced disappearances, and torture, monetary compensation is an insufficient remedy, and that the states are obligated to conduct an independent and impartial criminal investigation and prosecution. After the admissibility report was issued, the next step was to file a merits brief. The merits brief was an opportunity to submit new evidence and develop our arguments. In addition to hundreds of pages of exhibits, we submitted statements by three high-ranking former federal officials. The officials all had direct knowledge of Anastas the investigation of Anastasio's death, and they stated that the critical incident teams and others, other conduct related to the investigation constituted an attempt to cover up the responsibility of the agents for Anastasio's death. In our merits brief, we also doubled down on the argument that U.S. use of force violated the American, I'm sorry, U.S. use of force law violated the American de Declaration. Currently, there's no federal stand statute governing law enforcement use of force. 
Law enforcement use of force in the United States is governed by Supreme Court cases interpreting the U.S. Constitution. The Supreme Court has interpreted the U.S. Constitution to prohibit force that is objectively reasonable. According to the Supreme Court, objective, objectively, the objective reasonableness standard lacks, I quote, a precise definition. Courts must, I quote, balance the nature and quality of the intrusion on the individual's constitutional rights against the importance of governmental interests alleged to justify the intrusion. U.S. law and use of force fails to provide meaningful guidance to courts, attorneys, litigants about whether and when law enforcement's use of force is justified. What the Supreme Court does is create a balancing test. U.S. courts examine the conduct of law enforcement officers from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, rather than 2020 vision of hindsight. In the United States, the assessment of whether the force was lawful focuses on the perception of threat, whether on and not on the reality of threat. The protection provided by U.S. law on use of force um, against the right to life is extremely narrow. In contrast, international human rights standards on use of force are guided by the imperative of protecting the right to life, a supreme non-derogable right from arbitrary de deprivation by the state. International standards require that state agents use only force that is legal, necessary, and proportionate, and as a last result, state agents must always use persuasion and de-escalation tactics under international standards. And the decision to use force must be free from litigation, from discrimination. As reparations, we urged the commission to instruct the United States to reopen Anastasio's uh, investigate, the, invest, the investigation of Anastasio's death. We also asked the, that the commission instruct the United States to publicly disclose all the official records. There's been five investigations of the death, including a grand jury investigation, which the family has no information about. And we've at, we asked that the commission instruct the United States to reform use of force, laws and policy, among other measures. After the merits brief was submitted, we requested a hearing for the fall 2022 session of the Inter-American Mission. To accompany our request, we filed three amicus briefs, including from Ber one from Berkeley Law's Dean, Erwin Chemerinsky. The Inter-American Commission grants very few hearings on cases. Now, when I first started practicing before the Inter-American system in the early 2000s, most of the hearings granted involved individual cases. The public airing of allegations of grave human rights violations during these hearings was incredibly powerful. But in recent years, the commission has begun out of 20 hearings to only grant two or four to four hearings on individual cases. The commission, however, did grant our request for a hearing. A few days before the hearing, the United States filed a letter asking the commission to reverse its decision to close the proceeding, the hearing to the public, and to dismiss the case. The hearing proceeded as planned. At the hearing, Maria Puga testified about a 13 year, her 13 year struggle for justice. A Mexican immigration official who witnessed the beating testified that US border agents treated Anastasio, I quote, like an animal. He described how US border agents beat Anastasio and tased him, while he cried in pain, did not resist, and civilian eyewitnesses begged them to stop. The United States responded by reiterating the same arguments that were unsuccessful during the admissibility stage. The United States did not address the merits of the case during the hearing or any evidence that we had submitted during years of litigation, and they did not engage in inter-American case law or in human rights standards, really. Instead, three officials from Customs and Border Protection read what sounded like descriptions of general policies they had taken from the agency's website. To underscore my point, so two years after the largest social protests in US history, 
demanding the end to law enforcement violence, the United States' defense in a case involving an extrajudicial killing by law enforcement rested entirely on a one-page press release issued by the DOJ announcing its decision to close the investigation without bringing charges. Our strategy, and I'll end here, uh, in the case goes well beyond, however, the litigation. Our ambition is to ensure that the litigation and what it reveals about violence and impunity at the border reaches the people most affected. And we've pursued that goal through art. These are pictures of a mural located in San Diego's Chicano Park depicting Anastasio's violent death and his family's struggle for justice. This case has also re received a lot of media attention by major news outlets, outlets here in the United States, but San Alliance San Diego's amazing communication team has also been success successful in garnering attention from Latin America, particularly in Mexico. This case is well known in Mexico. We've also collaborated with documentary filmmakers um, these, this, is, uh, this slide includes um, screenshots from a documentary that Al Jazeera and P PBS did, and there will be a full-length HBO documentary about the case that will be released soon. We also started a binational campaign that centers the voices of victims most affected by law enforcement violence along the border. And the campaign claims and elevates human rights, particularly, as I said, on the issue of use of force. We've also gone to the United Nations. A delegation of 17 border community residents went to the UN in last October to participate in the Human Rights Committee's review of the United States and its compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We filed our last brief in Anastasio's case in February of last year, and now we're waiting for a decision from the Inter-American Commission. We want that decision. We hope that that decision provides a measure of justice, of course, for Anastasio's family. But it, we hope that it also serves as a favorable precedent to, for all the cases that are coming down the pipeline. So I like to just end now with the words of Maria Puga. So Maria Puga told the United Nations that the public hearing before the commission was the first time, I quote, we were able to show the world what had happened to Anastasio. The government did not respond to what happened. Instead, they talked about how justice works in the United States and said our case should not be heard by the commission. This felt like a slap in the face. The fight for justice is a painful and exhausting process, but Anastasio knew that he left his kids and the community in good hands with me. He made me strong. Already the case has garnered a lot of attention. People know Anastasio's name. They know his story. 13 years later, we have kept him alive. His death will not be in vain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roxana. Um, and I just want to encourage everyone to feel free to continue adding questions to the chat. And I'm going to um, go through some of them with you, Roxana. If we can take maybe one of the more recent ones first, just because you you just mentioned, you know, um, about wanting the decision to come down soon and to issue a have it act as precedent. You said it also functions as uplifting the voice of the family members and serving as a measure of justice. One of the questions is if the Commission does issue a decision against the US, then what happens? It depends on what the decision says. Um, assuming that the decision goes the way that we want it to go, which is that the decision doesn't only find that Anastasio was subjected to torture and his life was arbitrarily detained, but the system takes on the structures and, and the systems 
that have cultivated impunity and violence. That the commission directly takes on the objectively reasonableness standard, that the commission directly takes on some of the rules that govern the criminal investigation process, including the use of grand jury, uh, secret grand juries, then the, the decision becomes a goalpost. It becomes a rallying point. And the significance of that decision, given that the Inter-American Commission doesn't have an army or an enforcement mechanism, um, is really up for, to us, the advocacy community. It's up to, unfortunately, the community of survivors and victims um, who many times are motivated so deeply by the desire to ensure that no other family experiences the horrendous toll of a killing by law enforcement. And you, you mentioned there were a couple of questions about the enforcement mechanisms and just if, if you wanted to add anything there or if there was any other pressures that can be made to change law enforcement policies if, if the decision does go in the way that you hope it does. I think it changes the conversation if the commission finds that U.S. use of force law, the objectively reasonable standard, is a violation of international human rights. Um, it creates a series of challenges and questions that with allies in, in different branches of government, we, we can leverage. Um, it makes the United States also, um, it, it puts a through line, I think, to the cases like Anastasio's and Tamir Rice's case the cases like Michael Brown, which is currently pending before the Inter-American Commission. It identifies why those cases um, have resulted in impunity. And that can be a very powerful, like I said, rallying point. But there's nothing easy about these fights. Um, you know, the Inter-American system considers cases that are the worst and most difficult cases of the Americas. And Anastasio's case is, is, is no different. So these fights are generational fights, and they do require um, the investment and the support of a, of a large net. Thank you. Going back to some of the articles mm. that you shared in the media coverage, in particular the Al Jazeera one, um, can you talk a little bit about how the cover-up teams uh, were discovered during the litigation? So, like I said, we had a we we saw their fingerprints all over Anastasio's case, and then there there was um, work by Alliance San Diego and an investigator named Jen Budd, who also traced um, the their fingerprints in other cases. Um, in Anastasio's case, we had a copy of the police, uh, the San Diego Police Department's in, in investigation. And so we saw the names of the agents, we saw their signatures, we saw different, um, different uh, breadcrumbs that let, helped us understand um, their existence and the extent to which they were intervening in the investigation. Alliance, Southern Borders Communities Coalition, I think it was in October, 2021, but given my memory, I may get the year and the month wrong sent a letter uh, to a number of, um, well, congressional representatives, both in the House and the Senate. And um, that letter resulted in a congressional investigation, um, a government of, uh, office of accountability investigation, an investigation we understand by the Civil Liberties Unit of CBP, and so there are several investigations prompted by the evidence we um, revealed about um, SIT teams. Um, they're all ongoing, but there was this decision, as I mentioned, um, to, I think it was in, no, that was May 2021, I think, to disband um, the, the units. 
we have a question from a participant about um, asking whether you can speak about filing amicus briefs before the commission, including a bit about the process and the filing requirements. Yeah, the commission doesn't really have filing requirements um, and there's no specific limitation um, about when amicus briefs can be filed. Um, it depends on what issue the Amici um, want to address, whether it should be filed during the admissibility stage or in the merit stage. My understanding is most amicus briefs are filed in the merit stage because they um, uh, want to um, address substantive areas of law. Um, the Inter-American Court has a different set of rules and, and provides more guidance, but the commission is, is in very open to amicus briefs and don't really impose any word limitation or other types of limitations on who or how uh, amici can, can, can file the briefs. So you, you might have alluded to this a bit about was sort of the organizing and the other political pressure that was placed, but could you share a little bit about why you think the commission decided the admissibility stage so quickly and when you might expect the merit, merits decision? So this case, given its subject matter um, and given some of the challenges that the family was facing was fast tracked, it was expedited. Um, so, I mean, it certainly didn't feel quick. So it's four years. I know that that's quicker than some other cases. I think that it's also really important um, when you litigate before the inter-American system to understand how the secretariat works. And so this case became particularly important to the, special, the Office of the Special Rapporteur on Migrants. Um, and they were very interested in the case moving forward given the docket of issues and their priorities that they wanted to, 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 to address. And so like developing relationships with the members of the secretariat, I think is a really important um, part of this work. It is, um, and remember, you don't have to be a lawyer to litigate before the inter-American system, but I think that the idea of engaging in ex-party communications with the commission is, is a little bit, um, unfamiliar to U.S. lawyers, um, but it is um, part of, of the process before the Inter-American system. We have one question about whether there are any examples of Inter-American cases filed against multiple countries around a single policy or issue. Um, and the, the participant is asking because there are certain U.S. southern border policies that are only possible with the facilitation of the Mexican government. Yeah. I've thought about that question too. <laughs> Not that I know of. Um, I think that often um, to address regional standards, um, the, the manner in which that has been accomplished has been through advisory opinions before the Inter-American Commission. I don't know if anything specifically would prevent a litigant from simultaneously filing cases that are really individual petitions, but in their content very similar um, against multiple states. But I don't know of an example of in one petition, a party filing a case against multiple states. Um, Okay, well, that's that. Those are all the questions we have so far. So, since we have a few minutes left, let's pause for about a minute to see if there are any other questions that folks want to include. Um, and in the meantime, just want to thank Roxana so much for sharing your experience and this information today. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We're really happy that you all joined, and we hope to do it again in the future. So I just took a, took a list, uh, look at the questions and I can see former students here um, in this CLE. And I just wanted to say hello and send you all my love. Um, it's really wonderful just to see your name in print and please uh, remember to reach out to the clinic. As 
you know, we always say once you are part of the clinic, you're always part of the clinic. So happy to see your names. Okay, we have one other question is whether a case can be brought against non-state actors like multinational corporations, for example. Yeah, no, you, so the, the treaties are binding on the states. So certainly if a state fails to regulate the conduct of a non-state actor, a state can be held responsible for that failure. Um, it is not possible to bring uh, a petition and name a company as the defendant, um, but you can name the state um, that failed to regulate appropriately and sufficiently and adequately the company's conduct. We're seeing some thank yous and some um people who are keeping in touch with the clinic. So the only drawback of the webinar format is not being able to see everyone's faces, but um, appreciate everyone being here and get to see names and familiar names pop up. And thank you to the alumni team for organizing this event with us. And we thank you for being here and thank you, Roxana. And we'll hang on for another minute or so um, as, as people can sign off and ask any lingering questions. Otherwise, we will see you next time. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to reiterate Laura's call. If you have ideas of future CLEs um, don't, that you would like clinical faculty to lead, don't forget to send Laura a message and let her know. And we will be sure to consider those suggestions. And thank you so much for your time. And I hope that you found the presentation helpful. Thank you so much.